started here as a walk-on four years ago. He'd like nothing better than to hit that buzzer tonight. He's got a big group up from Edinburgh with We Are All Able signs. That's his motto. Abel's area in South Texas has been hard hit by COVID-19, and more recently, a hurricane. So he wants to give his hometown something to smile about. Hit the right button. Hit the right button. No! Oh. He adopted and helped raise his younger brothers. He built a ninja course in his hometown and has made it his mission to make South Texas healthier. This is a man who knows how to fight for what's important. My name is Abel Gonzalez. I'm from Edinburgh, Texas. Originally, I'm from Chicago. My parents uh, were young and they moved over there to pursue uh, entrepreneurship. But uh, half of my family lives in Chicago, my mom's side, and half of my dad's side lived down here. And that's how I ended up in Chicago and also down here in Edinburgh. The fact that our metro is one of the most obese in the country, it's, uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. And I think we have to attack those reasons rather than just blaming people for doing what they're doing. You know, and then there's reasons like poverty, there's reasons like uh, language barriers. There's a lot of reasons for it. Um, but I think really what we need to do is teach self-empowerment. From there, you can come out of anything. The first gyms that I had, it was actually like a personal training gym. So I, I was a personal trainer. I would train people uh, at, at home. And then when I found out about Ninja, I decided to make a Ninja Warrior gym. And then we, me and my friend, we teamed up and we made one in his backyard. The modality, if you want to call it that, is this whole concept of movement training. The ability to move your body the, exactly the way you want it, the way you want to move it. So if you want to do vertical push, these are different dimensions of movement. Uh, there are seven total dimensions and you want each dimension to have a, a certain level of strength, mobility, flexibility, and awareness. Mostly because I felt that there was a gap in this type of training. There was a gap in, in whether you want to call it yoga, calisthenics, movement type training, not like just weightlifting or Olympic lifting. There was a gap and I wanted to fill that gap because that gap helped me you know, reduce a lot of injuries, recover from injuries, reduce a lot of pain in my body. And I thought it was very beneficial to open it. And then when Ninja Warrior came around, it really worked well with that. And I enjoyed doing that. So I combined them both and that's how I made my gym. I've been a coach for about five years now and I've been a student here since I was 11, so seven years. Okay. And what got me into this was uh, an opportunity that Abel came up with. He gave a free class for homeschoolers and I, I did it one time and I loved it. We started off at the Ground Zero Gym, which was his original site, uh -huh. and uh, then we moved to the Alpha Fitness Gym, where we had we rented out a little corner of the gym to do obstacles, wow. and uh, yeah, I fell in love with it. The way it works on American Ninja Warrior is that everybody sends in an application that wants to try to be on the show, and then they pick out of those applications. So the year that I tried out, there was about 15 or 16,000 applications, and they picked 500 people. So that's really rare to get picked, right? Uh, now it's upwards of 50, 60,000 people, and they still only pick 500 people. So it's still insanely difficult to get on the show. Um, I was a rookie. No one really knew who I was, but I had trained in Houston with a, with a friend of mine who became actually a longtime friend of mine, uh, Sam Sam, and he told me how to get on the show. He told me that if you apply and they don't call you by a certain date, then you're not on the show. The only other way to get on the show is to go wait in line at something called the walk-on line at the site where they're building the course and try to be in the first 15 people or so to get a shot. Because usually those first 10 to 12, 15 people, they're like the testers to make sure everything's working good, making sure that it looks good, make sure the camera's good and the lighting is good, make sure it looks good for TV. And then they have their original people that they called go after those people in the walk-on line. So luckily enough, he told me that uh, to, to drive up, to be in the walk-on line and that there was already one person in line. Uh, and, and I told him that I'm going, I'm going tomorrow. I'm going tonight. So me and my friend, I, told, I convinced my friend Nathan Hassa to go, and we both drove up that day, and we were like number three, number four in line. Uh, that was five days early. So after that, that rookie season, I ended up make, having one of the best rookie seasons of all time. And since then, they've called me every season to be on the show. The thing that really got me into it 
into this is when I was driving, I saw this huge wall that we have outside, which is called Woto, and I wondered what that place was, so I came in, and I saw the wall, and then I found out there was an American Ninja Warrior gym. I've been watching American Ninja Warrior for almost my, my whole life, and then I met Abel. He's a professional American Ninja Warrior. He's my coach, and he's my mentor, and he's... He's been helping me a lot to this. He helped, this helped change my life completely and this gym changed my life. Yeah, I uh, always felt like my little brothers were like my greatest gift. I don't know why, I just always felt that way. Whenever I saw them, I just had pure joy. I don't know what it is. I don't know if that's every sibling, but for me it was, so I was always with them. Uh, they were my younger brothers for the most part and I, I just had an absolute love for them that I can't even explain. Like everything I've done was kind of based around them. Why did I think I could even adopt my brothers? You know, as a teenager, I tried to. I was, I was 17 when I first attempted that, you know, and my mother said I wasn't responsible enough. You know, that's a good answer. You know, that was something that was kind of like a challenge to me. So I decided, well, if I'm not responsible enough at 17, then I'm going to work until I am and I'm going to prove to you that I am and then I'm going to ask again. I literally told her that I'm going to ask you again. Uh, so I ended up graduating high school. I was the first person in my family to graduate high school. I uh, got a good job. I bought a car in my own name. You know, this was really hard to do back in the day uh, as a 19-year-old, as a 20-year-old to, uh, to do that. And I did that when I was 20. I asked her again if I could uh, get legal custody of my two younger brothers and move them from Chicago to Illinois or from Chicago to Texas. And uh, she said yes. So at 20 years old, uh, my brother, my younger brother, Matthew and I, we got legal custody of our two younger brothers, um, Eddie and Jacob. And we packed them up and moved over here as soon as I graduated. Right when we moved over here uh, from, from Illinois, uh, it was, insanely stressful. You know, I was 20 years old. I didn't know what it was like to, to try to raise kids. Yeah. Even though they weren't that young, they were in, in middle school and things, but it was still a huge responsibility. We had to get them through school. We had to buy them clothes and things like that. We had a, uh, luckily my family here in Texas really helped us out. Uh, they gave us a place to stay and, and things like that. But um, it, it was really, it could have been the stressor that triggered rheumatoid arthritis in me, uh, rheumatoid arthritis in me, but I, I don't know for sure. But I noticed that that was the first time I started getting symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, those symptoms, I covered them up with painkillers on a daily basis. I took uh, four to five painkillers in the morning, four to five at night, and I, and I did that for, for three years. Uh, that way I could continue working because it was really painful. I mean, it's always been my dream to like, to go on the show, you know, to be on the show. And when I first started, I kind of got hurt, and then Abel like brought me back into it, and he, you know, kind of like saved my life, you know, because I didn't want to, you know, keep doing this, all this and that. And I mean, I just love coaching the kids, you know, love Abel. It's very fun, especially when you get to do your passion, you know, and I get to coach kids and, and train every day. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, during that time, all the stress and all these things, and then I just became a very negative person. You know, my younger brother, Matthew, has been kind of a hero to me. Uh, he, he's my, he's one year younger than me, but I, I've taken advice from him. He, he's gone through so many things himself. Uh, we both took the divorce in very different ways, and we both uh, uh, tried to come out of it in different ways, too. Uh, but he gave me some advice one day. He told me that uh, my younger brothers, they didn't like me. They didn't like being around me and uh, that I was a very negative person. And when that, that really hit me hard because, you know, I'm like 24 years old. I just pretty much sacrificed everything just to bring them down here, you know, and to have a put a house over a roof over their head and, and, and get them through school and help them graduate. And I took them on road trips. I mean, I did everything, you know, for them. But for them to say they didn't even like me, uh, that really hurt. So uh, I had to ask why. Why was I a negative person? Why, how could it be that the people that I did this for not like me? And that was a, a general question. You know, it was a really good question. I, I didn't take it personally, but I, it did hit me. And it was like, who are you? Why are you negative? Um, and then, uh, for, so from there, I literally had this whole cascade of questions of why, 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 why am I the way I am? Why am I overweight? Why am I hurting? Why uh, am I negative? Why do my brothers not like me? And when I ask those questions, when you ask those questions about yourself uh, and you look for things, you'll see that there are people that have gone through something very similar and they have advice, you know, or that there's things that you can change about yourself. And that was the biggest thing. Uh, I was probably about 24, 25 when I really decided to attack my mindset and go after this uh, negative, negative mindset that I had. Uh, I was very angry at times. It was very easy to get me upset. Uh, and those are things that I still work on, but it's very different from what I used to be. Yeah. With those changes, I mean, I think the biggest thing was that there was an intentional attempt to find out who I am and how can I be better? Uh, and that was very intentional. I mean, I read books, I watched videos, I went to seminars, I traveled hours, I, I drove overnight, I slept in cars just so I can be at a certain seminar at a certain time uh, to find out who am I and how can I be better. I put a lot of money invested into my, my character and my mindset. And basically what it ends up doing, which is probably the greatest thing you could ever do, is improve your relationships with those you love. 
when I was a kid and I was going through Chicago and, and being chased and beat up and people were stealing my bikes and stealing my stuff and I was living in a, in a school bus, in a flea market, like I knew that these were stories that I was gonna tell. Like I knew it. I, I knew that one day I was gonna tell a thousand people this story. You know, and when I went to the show on NBC and I did well enough to be featured, you know, in one day went from this idea that I was going to speak to a thousand people to to six million in one night. So I, I just knew it. You know, I knew it. So every and I think that's a really good mentality to have, because what happened was anytime something did come up, like an obstacle or a bad situation or something that made me uncomfortable, I said, this is just going to be another chapter in your book right? and you're going to overcome it and you're going to tell them how you did it. I, I think this is a concept that it's not very popular, but it's the truth. Uh, life is not fair. You know, I, I was born into an abusive relationship with my with my father. Um, my mother, he was abusive to her. When she left, he was abusive to me. So it's not like gonna be perfect, but life is a gift. So you just have to make the most of it. So you could be born with certain conditions. I mean, and it's terrible. You could be born with cancer. I mean, that's very scary and it's not fair. It's not fair. Um, and I hope we can all make it. You know, we, we just have to do our best to make it. So if I do have, no, uh, I mean, if I do, when I do have children, um, if they're going to come across a condition like that, they're going to know my story. They're going to know that they might have to live with it. They're going to know that maybe they can overcome it. Maybe they should overcome it. Maybe they will. Maybe they're supposed to. So they're going to have this outlook that no matter how bad it gets or how unfair it seems, we can make something out of this life.